Morning Church. My name is Rene. I'm one of the pastors here. And um, I have the privilege of bringing God's Word, um, reading out of God's Word, and sharing a few things that are in my heart. Um, if you are new to our church, if you're visiting, uh, please don't establish any opinions about what this church is about based on today. I'm just, uh, I'm just one of the pastors. I'm not um, a lead pastor. So uh, there's way better preachers here on a Sunday. So come back. This is God saying come back next Sunday, right? Um, so today we're finally finalizing our series on prayer, uh, reading out of Matthew chapter 6. Next week, spoiler alert, we're starting a new series. Should I spoil it? Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. It's fine. Uh, we're going we're gonna to be having a new series on 2 Timothy, so um, join us. We'd love to uh, read together and learn what God's going to do with this community as we enter this new season. Amen? All right, so the last few weeks, we have been talking about the importance of rhythms in our spiritual lives. Fasting is one of those rhythms that can recalibrate our hearts. It's a way to hit pause on the noise of life and tune in to the voice of God. Now, if there's a summary to what we have been learning in the last few weeks, um, is Jesus is teaching on not doing the right things for the wrong reasons. Have you ever done that? Have you ever done the right things for the wrong reasons? I know when we were dating with Jeannie, I can't count the number of things that I did. I walked like this. I kept sucking in the gut. Like, hey, what's up, man? Check, check him out. No. Wrong reasons, right? She have just been working on my character more than that. But she still, she still said yes, so it worked. Anyways, referring to people who do the right things for the wrong reasons, Jesus calls people who do such things hypocrites. Now, hypocrites is another word for actors. I'm not taking a shot at Hollywood. If you remember ancient history in Greece, they have the guys with the two masks, right? Hypocrites, two faces. But also, a hypocrite is someone who claims to live by a standard when they do not. Amen? So think about that as, as we continue on the passage. The passage today will take us to some verses that many of us will find challenging. I know I do. Even though these passages are deeply, these verses are deeply transformative, uh, I want you to think about our main idea for today. Our main idea for today's message is fasting deepens our communion with God. Now, if you're a millennial, I want you to think about it this way. Fasting levels up your connection with God. And for my high school peeps over here, fasting takes our vibe with God to a whole new level. Amen? There you go. So, before you tune me out and start thinking that I'm going to uh, talk about skipping meals, let's just, hit a, just bear with me for a minute. Because when Jesus said these words that we're about to read again, he wasn't dishing diet tips. He was inviting his audience and you and I into something much deeper. How to unplug from the world and plug into him. So grab your spiritual fork and knife because this isn't about what's on your plate. It's about what's in your hearts. Amen? All right, scripture reading again. So when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who is sees in secret will reward you. Let me pray. Father God, I pray this morning that these words impact our lives in a way that they haven't before. May they convict us and lead us into a, into a deeper place of communion with you, Father. So I pray that the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts, Father. And uh, if these people never remember my name, it's okay, Father. I hope and pray. My prayer is that they remember your words. Holy Spirit, we give you, we give you permission to cancel out whatever dumb things I'm going to say and let it, be your, let it be your message. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so from the beginning of this chapter, Jesus has been teaching his disciples not to call attention to themselves in public. When they worship, when they give to the needy, when they pray. Now he's going to apply this same basic lesson to fasting. Look at the beginning of verse 16, the very first few words. It says, when you fast. He's been speaking of spiritual practices, giving, praying, and now fasting. He says these things knowing that this is something his disciples or his audience regularly practice. 
because Jesus' followers were primarily observant Jewish people. So fasting was not an uncommon practice to them. It was commanded in the Law of Moses in Leviticus 23. And over time, during the times of exile, the Jewish people had expanded the practice. You can read more about this in Zechariah 7 and 8. Their practices of fasting were, as their experience grew, as their need grew, they, it became a more regular rhythm in their lives. Now, for the sake of clarification, to fast, in this context that we're reading today, to fast simply means to not eat for a period of time. Can we say that again? Fasting means to not eat for a period of time. Now, the fact that Jesus said, when you fast, speaks to a human posture. Think about it. Every time we read scripture, we have a posture, whether we like it or not, towards God and the things that he calls us to do. And the posture that he's speaking when he says, when, is, the, is not a, if you choose to do this, if you are, if you're pro level, do this. Or if you forget to skip a meal, might as well pray and get something out of it. He's not saying these things. When carries an implication that believers practice these things. Amen? So we're going to go in there right off the bat. When you fast. The second part of the verse, it says, Do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Jesus said this because um, some religious Jews regarded fasting as a mark of general piety not just prayer. It was a mark. It was Pharisees and scribes were known for fasting twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays. And many wanted to make sure that everybody knew they were fasting. So they would have a facial expression that would make evident to everyone around them how much they were suffering. If you don't know what a gloomy face is, a gloomy face is the face I make when we go out to dinner with my wife and she gets dessert and I don't. And then I realize my mistake. And I'm trying to appeal to her, and I'm like, oh, that looks so good, right? It works every time. Guys, take notice. It works every time. As the most strictly religious people in Israel, they were intensely proud of that status, which makes me wonder about our human posture. What are we proud of as Christians? I'm not like those sinners over there. What are we proud of? Here's one thing I want you to think about as we read this. Our pride can corrupt something good and to turn it into something bad. That's how this speaks to me. Now, in the last part of verse 16, when Jesus says, Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Jesus was warning his audience that the hypocrites' fasting was more about putting on a show more about receiving applause. Oh, you're so good. Words of praise. Admiring looks. Look, that's someone who, who fasts. Maybe once in a while when they're walking out, they we get a high five from the kid in the back? Like, yay! Right? But that's all. They would, they would receive this kind of human reward, but they would not receive a reward from God. Therefore, do not fast like them. It speaks of a human posture of self-interest right? Self-interest is only for here because it carries no eternal reward. There's a famous uh, English preacher, Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones. He said, ultimately, our only reason for pleasing men around us is that we may be pleased. Notice that posture of self-interest. Many times, this is, listen, this is something as I was writing these things, I was uncomfortable for the last two weeks writing some of these things going like, all right, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm taking shots on myself all day. These are things that I struggle with. Because remember, as a pastor, I can't wait when I'm into a conversation and people say, what do you think about this? Well, let me tell you. I love that, right? We all do that. So in contrast, Jesus instructs his followers this way in verse 17. Notice when he says, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Don't forget to take care of yourselves as usual. And to make, fast, to, to make the fast something before God and not people around you. Apparently, some would skip their normal grooming on days they would fast, right? This is my fasting shirt. Kind of like today, this is my preaching shirt. Jeannie wouldn't let me wear a t-shirt even though it's Labor Day, right? Now, these words don't mean that we, th this word doesn't mean that no one at all can know that we're fasting, right? Maybe someone comes to you and says like, hey, I'm going to take you out to lunch. I can't. Why? Because I can't. We, it's fine. Let's just not 
when we do some of these spiritual practice, practices, when we engage in them, let's just not put them on a billboard, right? Like, by the way, no one contact me today, you know, today after church for lunch. I'm fasting. Just so you know, I'm fasting. No, I'm not fasting. You can take me out to lunch. It's okay. Great. Now, the human posture that Jesus is addressing in these words is the attention we receive because of our spiritual choices can easily become an idol in our lives. Think about the, when, you, when, you, when, when you start using, you know, um, let, me, let me take that point back. Pastor Cassidy was teaching a few weeks ago about using fancy words when we pray. Many times we engage into that practice, not out of love for God and his word, but we do it because of the recognition we get from people. Those are spiritual choices that become an idol in our lives. Then finally, in verse 18, Jesus makes a similar statement to the comments he made about charity in verse 4 and prayer in verse 6. Verse 18, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. To me, this is a much better way of saying, do these things for an audience of one. Jesus is making a point that God notices when his people honor him in their hearts, even if nobody else knows it. Jesus emphasizes that God truly cares more about the hearts and motivations of his people than their outward outward actions. Think about how much these words resonate against the culture of today. When people, have, when people put on their accounts, on their social media, all the things that they're doing, contrary to what God's saying, like, do these things for an audience of one. Number one, that's your real motivation. Every time your motivation is to have more followers, there's something wrong. Reminds me of a story of a guy who decided to, to take on a rhythm of fasting. And he spent, you know, after the first day, you know, he was dealing with the struggle of, you know, the hunger and just thinking about food. Couldn't wait till he was done with it so he could go get a big old meal. And he says, you know what? I'm going to encourage other people, and I'm going to put it on social media. First day of fasting, on the books, hashtag blessed, hashtag spiritual practices. And then people started commenting on it. And then he realized that his hunger switched from food to attention. Amen? It's one example of the things that we can do where our, where our outward actions can be a bigger motivation than the, the motivation in our hearts. Paul par- parallels this in Galatians 1 where he says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. But here's the beautiful part. Here's the caveat. Not only God sees, he rewards such behavior. The great Dallas Willard said, spiritual people are not those who engage in certain spiritual practices. They are those who draw their life from a conversational relationship with God. How deep is that? And I made sure to put the quote. Do not want to be compared. You know, these are not my words. These are definitely the words of someone much smarter and deeper than I am. But it speaks of a true reward. The reward is true fellowship with God. The human posture that that we're seeing here develop in front of us is an empty works-based religious system that can keep us from a reward. It is not a works-based religious system. It is about the reward, which is God, his voice speaking to us. Now, it's hard to evaluate how this teaching landed with the original audience, right? These people had lived their entire lives under a performance-driven religious system where image, reputation, honor, and shame were all that mattered. They were like ribbons of pride in their lives. That's not how it's supposed to work, but that's how it had come to be practiced. So Jesus comes not to condemn the practice of fasting, He's simply calling, it, calling out something good that was corrupted by the hypocrisy of the people in, in Jesus' time. So you may be thinking, like, what do I do with this knowledge? How do I walk out of here? What do I take from this? Here's a few takeaways that I want you to think about this morning. Number one, 
is that we misunderstand fasting. Because in our modern context, fasting is either taken as uh, some weird dietary tips or is seen as an outdated religious practice. Oh, that's what people did back in the day when they were in exile. We're not in exile. Let's be clear. Fasting isn't about punishing yourself or trying to earn God's favor or here's the one thing you need to do to unlock the bounty of God's favor upon your life. Fasting. No. It's about creating space. It's about putting your pride aside so that we can focus on what truly matters, our relationship with God. Jesus is not calling out hypocrites because they're fasting, but because of their motive. They're seeking the glory of men rather than the glory of God. So remember, fasting is not about impressing other people. It's about, or about strong-arming God into responding our prayers. It's about deepening your connection with God. Can we say amen to that? Sorry, I like responses. The second thing I want you to think about this morning is that there is a reward in fasting. Because some associate fasting with, um, to some people, thinking of a reward while fasting seems kind of illogical, kind of weird, even counterintuitive. Counterintuitive. After all, we're denying ourselves something we need for, for survival, right? Food. I need that daily burger. I'm kidding. I don't need it. The reward is not earthly recognition. It's not success. It's not love. Christians can enjoy those things, can experience those things, but that is not what the reward is. The reward is in what fasting enables us to experience an unhindered communion with God himself. The reward is him. Can we say that? The reward is him. Think about it. The praise of man is temporary. The approval of the Father is enduring. The reward of man is a vapor. The reward of the Father is in Jesus forever. Third thing is that the effect of fasting helps us calibrate on mission. The Bible is filled with accounts of men and women fasting as a means of earnest intercession. In the Old Testament, we have Nehemiah, who was a captive but prominent Jew in Babylon. And when he heard, when he heard the, the stories of the destruction of his hometown, Jerusalem, and the people still living there, being described as survivors, which is not a hopeful thing to be called. When Nehemiah heard the report, he tears his clothes and starts fasting and praying on their 800-mile behalf, asking God to help them. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4 says, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants. I want to be honest with you. These words hit me hard because Nehemiah was in a good place. Even though he was, he was captive, he was serving in the palace. He had a role of prominence. He was fine. He took care of number one, right? But when he heard the tribulation of others, he suffered it in the flesh. But his first response was not to strategize. His first response not, was not to post it on social media and say, hey, everybody donate this cause that I'm really serious about. His first Step, his first response was to fast and pray. Before doing anything, he went to God with everything. I believe that you and I, if we want to live on mission today, we need to take that same heart. We all have someone in our lives who doesn't know Jesus. We all have that one relative with whose relationship we wish things were better. We all know someone. And are you willing to fast and pray for that person? Are you willing to suffer in the flesh out of love for them? Are you willing to skip a meal because you love them and you care? Are you willing to fast and pray for Reno and Sparks to come to Christ? Amen. I'm not going to wait for you. I'm just going to say it. Yes, I am willing to do it. 
And I'm going to share with you. I'm going to be honest with you. Fasting, even though I'm called to ministry, fasting has been a difficult thing for me. I remember when I was, before I was called formally to ministry, our youth pastor, he was always doing like 30-hour famine for Rwanda. And, or, you know, and I was like, sure, first day, maybe just a cracker. And by lunchtime, I was just done, right? I would come back to church on Sunday. How'd you do? It was awesome, bro. It was awesome. Not really, not really, right? And then when I was called to, when I was called to ministry, I, so, I slowly started facing out those events because I was terrible at it. You may notice I like food. It's a difficult, cha- it's a difficult thing for me until I start thinking about those people who don't know Christ. Until I start thinking about my friend, my, my Bible college classmate who is a missionary in South Sudan. Until I start thinking about how many people in this town where God has called me and say, we need more churches. We need more believers. We need this church. We need this church as we enter a new phase, a new era, a new chapter. We need to fast and pray for those who don't know Christ. Beginning in my household, in this church, in our streets, and in our city. We need to fast because our need is great and our God is greater. In fasting, we're saying to God, our spiritual need is greater than our temporary physical discomfort. And the supply for both comes for God alone. This is how we calibrate into mission. Fasting and praying, saying like, this is how much I care. That my awesome Monday lunch does not matter compared to God, God's presence in my life and me calibrating onto his mission. So here's how we make fasting uh, an initial step in your life. If, if, if maybe fasting is a challenge for you, maybe you have some uh, physical needs, health issues that prevent you right now. For example, Sarah, please do not fast. Please do not fast, sister. Maybe right now you can't enter into fasting, fasting in this season. Maybe a partial fast or fasting from something other than food. I remember talking to Pastor Cassidy, and he's like, what is the strongest appetite in your life? Because honestly, I could easily fast from kale, (laughs) to be honest with you. Maybe think, what is the strongest appetite in your life right now? You know what? You know what our strongest? Maybe maybe we don't struggle like in the times of Jesus where people didn't have fast food available to them when they traveled, and they ate when they could, when they had to forage to eat. You know what our strongest appetite for most of us is? Yeah, it is. This is, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I love that Pastor Cassidy and Pastor Glenn have come as, as brothers to convict me every meeting where I'm like, uh-huh, I'm listening. Uh-huh, I'm listening. I need it because that's my strongest appetite. It doesn't matter if it's scores, if it's the latest hashtag on social media, whatever it is. I'm doing things that are becoming the strongest appetite in my life. But that's me. Maybe asking some of you to Fast from social media is not the thing. Fine. Talk to your spouse. Talk to your best friend. Talk to your accountability partner. What, is, what do you think is my strongest appetite? What is Self-evaluate in a way that you are able to pinpoint what that is and partially fast from it or completely fast from it. Definitely something that you really crave that keeps you from praying more. But focus on prayer. Use the time you would normally spend time eating or engaging in those activities to pray and seek God. Number three, don't virtue signal. Obey Jesus and keep it between you and God. This isn't about showing off your spirituality. It's about deepening it. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean that we can't give testimonies of how God has operated. I remember last year at the pastor's conference that we went to in uh, last summer, not this past summer, but the one before that, uh, we heard the testimony of a pastor who wrote a great book on, on sexuality. And he's like, I used to be a homosexual. And I used to be a, you know, a drug dealer. And this, 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 um, this launch, uh, launched my parents into becoming Christians and pray for me. And he shared the little prayer booklet that his mom would put together every Monday that she would pray for his salvation. And it's a little booklet that was folded, kind of like a accordion tile. And then he drops it. When he's sharing that testimony and the whole thing unfolds over the stage and down. 
It was incredibly impactful. But I'm pretty sure that lady, that mom, she carried that little booklet of prayer for over her son for years before he, she shared what that was. Because, she would, because every time she tried to tell him, like, you need to come to God and stop doing those things. He was like, I want nothing to do with God. So I can't imagine how long she carried that little booklet before she was able to share it. So yes, do engage in fasting. Don't virtue signal. But know that God is, God is writing a testimony with what he's doing in your life. And lastly, reflect on the reward. Yes, it is difficult to think about other things when we're fasting. But as you fast and you reflect on those spiritual rewards, which is greater intimacy with God, increased self-control, a deeper sense of purpose, and a real burden for those who don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Because I love food, but I would love to see others come to Christ more. Now, I'm aware that some of you here this morning may not identify with Jesus as, you may not identify as religious or as a Jesus follower. You may even have questions about your faith. If you feel a deep longing in your heart or a hunger, then nothing in this world like success, money, or comfort has ever truly satisfied. Know this, that longing is for something only God can provide. The Bible says that this desire for a right relationship with God is a deep soul level need. And the good news is that there is one who can fulfill it. Jesus Christ. So if you're tired of chasing after things that leave you empty, Jesus invites you to come. Believe in him. He's not offering you temporary relief. He's offering you eternal satisfaction. So today... If you're feeling that hunger, that thirst for something more, don't ignore it. Jesus is calling you to trust in him, to receive the life he can only give. So this morning as we close, I'm going to invite, I'm going to, I'm going to invite you to join me in prayer for the next season of Sierra Bible, specifically for our No Grow Share Ministries. This Wednesday, we're starting, we're kickstarting our fall midweek uh, event where Awana youth, uh, youth group and other Bible studies are going to get kick-started. And we're definitely entering into a season where we're going to be out there more saying like, Jesus loves you. You need to hear more about him. With the youth, we've been praying. Last year, we were praying for, uh, for the one. We're praying for the one friend we're going to share Christ with. Well, today we're going to pray for that, for that mission, that mission to know, grow, and share more. And I think it's going to come up on the stage, but it is, we're going to pray that Sierra Bible Church would stay rooted in God's word, know Christ better each day, and respond in worship. We're going to pray that deep transformative relationships with other believers, believers are built and sustained. We're going to pray by name for one person who you interact with regularly, who is not yet a follower of Jesus. Find three or four people around you. And pray for each other. Let's pray as a family here that God makes us bold enough that God continues to bless those ministries and that God keeps adding to our number because God is going to change Reno and Sparks because we are committed to what he's doing. Amen? So we're going to take, some, we're going to take a few minutes. Uh, find yourself three or four people. Pray. Pray.